<laughs> um, so uh, uh, I'll kick it off. My name's Chris Rubal. I am the account manager for Palo Alto Networks. Um, we did a little bait and switch with you. Roger Schatzel, my SE, was going to do this, and uh, um, and uh, but it worked out this way. So uh, I've been with the company for about three years. What we wanted to do with this is in our advisory board, we were sitting down with the public sector folks, and um, one of the topics they wanted to cover was next generation firewalls. It's around network modernization. Um, it's really what I have seen to be a pretty critical piece of infrastructure when you know, chosen correctly. Uh, but the market in general has a lot of noise around that term. Um, a name does not necessarily clearly define a piece of technology, so everybody can call themselves a next generation firewall. It doesn't mean they're necessarily delivering it. So the way that we broke this up is I'm going to try to get out of the way as quickly as possible because we wanted it to, to be an interactive conversation with the guests that I brought here from Department of Healthcare Services who have deployed next generation firewall technology. They understand it. Um, and what we wanted to really provide you with is one really kind of selection criteria for if you're looking at this, what should it contain? You know, this isn't a sales pitch. It's more around trying to educate, educate you on if you're looking for a next generation firewall, what should it be able to do? What capabilities should you be looking for? And why is it time to start thinking about modernizing your security infrastructure and security operations? Um, and then we're going to do a moderated question and answer. I'm going to um, answer the, have these guys answer some questions that we've pre prepared. And then we'll more or less just open it up from there to give you guys an opportunity to interact with some folks that have deployed it, ask questions, and get those answered for people that have actually done it. Because um, I really think that if properly selected, a next generation firewall is one of those smart moves that can help you with a lot of other projects and initiatives from a security standpoint and just a day to day network operations as well in your organization. It's, it can be a very critical piece of IT infrastructure to help you with day to day business operations. And I think these guys, you know, would attest to that and have, having actually deployed it. So, really quickly, um, Palo Alto Networks, uh, we've been a publicly traded company going on about three years here in July. Um, we started shipping product, uh, products in uh, 2007. And, um, you know, really what has allowed us to rise to prominence is that we coined the term and really set the vision and, and, and story around what a next generation firewall is. So we coined that term. We've really done a good job with our success in defining it as the standard for enterprise network security products. Um, and so what we've done is really have more of an application-centric platform that has things like user identity and understanding and awareness of threats built into it. So we've been shipping that product since 2007. Um, if you look at us from a revenue standpoint, we hit the billion dollar run rate revenue mark um, last year, and uh, or actually last quarter. So we've gone, um, you know, it's a pretty meteoric rise from a revenue standpoint. Um, and we're also, you know, adding a lot of customers as well. We're growing smart. We have absolutely outstanding support. Um, so we know how to build partnerships. We know how to support our customers. We know how to make fit, you know, happy customers. So with that having been said, if we consider sort of where we're at and why really organizations need to consider a different approach to enterprise network security um, is really because of the market that we're in has fundamentally changed. You know, we gone are the days of us being able to continue to do what we did before in security. Security used to be more or less a tag along thing that you bought from your network company. You know, companies like Cisco and Juniper, and, and, and you buy your firewalls from the network company. But security has really kind of come out of the, the shadows and become more of one of strategic conversations with businesses and really more of a core, really a core technology in IT. And the reason why is, you know, this information here. Attacks are increasingly targeted. They're far more sophisticated than they used to be. You know, people are in the news on a fairly regular basis using the methods that we have predominantly used to, to protect our networks in the past. And so that's really driving towards you need to rethink your security architectures, where you have visibility into your network, and the technologies that you're using. Um, and so considering new technologies and different ways of doing things is really going to be the, the way to try to get ahead and get yourself um, 
you know, uh, more attuned to, to protecting yourself from these threats. Um, and if you look at sort of that attacker, you know, what has changed is that there is a far greater level of sophistication in the attacks that we've seen out there in the market. And you can see here you've got, you know, known threats that are out here. We've got lateral movement, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of threats that we've seen. The, the advanced persistent threat is a term that's used to describe an attack that has multiple stages, has multiple techniques that are being deployed to actually execute and successfully engage in an attack on a company. Um, think of like the target attack. There was a heavy element of a lot of these different techniques. What you see is that you've got this cocktail of different, you know, malware and zero-day vulnerabilities and applications and spear phishing campaigns to get credentials. Um, there's a heavy element of the insider threat that the initial sort of uh, foothold that, it, that an attacker has is inside of your network. Um, and so that's very common. You know, the, the time it takes to understand one of these attacks is going on can take you, you know, several hundred days to see it. Um, so you see a lot more organizational risk. We're in, uh, there is a lot more uh, risk to, you know, business continuity and our ability to provide a consistent, you know, service to our customers, um, the business owners, with, with the market that's out there today. And then if you look at the way that we've been building security architectures, um, this is really kind of at the core of what our problem is. Most customers' networks tend to look like this. What you have is a very edge-centric security profile, uh, not a lot of internal segmentation or visibility between zones inside of your data center. Um, and really what you see is a lot of investment on either, you know, in the case here you see like UTMs or blades or some conga line of equipment that sits behind your firewall. The firewall tends to be the first primary thing that you have out there, but more or less if you look at legacy firewalls, they're really no more than routers with ACLs on them. They look at the world like IP addresses or users, ports or applications, but the way that we consume IT and the way that applications are being developed, those two things are increasingly meaningless to actual security. So what you end up doing is layering on technology behind it to try to serve one iterative purpose to help the firewall out, whether it be a proxy or a web gateway or an intrusion prevention system or one of those other sort of you know, add-on technologies behind the firewall. Um, the problem, especially in the public sector that we have, is that, you know, the public sector has limited resources from a human capital standpoint. And so what you see is issues with actually having expertise and capabilities across all those technologies. So we can go out and spend a million dollars to pile on boxes to protect the edge of our network, but then there's a lot of operational efficiency loss in that. Um, and then the, the, the architecture is, is very difficult to maintain and get to all the places that you need it to actually be effective. The edge of our network is not just at the edge of our network anymore. It's in our mobile devices, it's in software as a service offerings that we're getting, it's in our data centers. You know, there's a lot of different places we need to look at in the edge. So having to go and reinvest all of that capital to be able to just get visibility in your traffic is really a broken model. And so what you see in terms of risk is that, you know, that, that particular architecture has very limited visibility. All those devices that sit behind the firewall usually only get a piece of your network. They don't see everything. And what you don't see, you can't protect. I think visibility is a critical element that you need to focus on in looking at modernizing your security operations. The technologies that you have should be able to give you a lot better visibility into who's on your network, what applications are being used, their behavior, potentially dangerous activity, and then be able to actually take action on that. The other thing is that this model really lacks integration. You know, if you see that particular approach, you tend to, t to do things like offload all of your logs to some event manager or SIM so that you can actually get some visibility into the traffic. Um, the problem with that is you don't have a complete view of everything. So if you've got one of these complicated attacks that's taking multiple different angles into your network, how do you get visibility into that? If they're doing a spear phishing campaign and then sideloading an application onto a device and moving around laterally in your network, how do you get visibility into that without having you know, one context view into everything you're trying to, to protect your network from? 
And then lastly is a lot of the responses have been manual. Um, if you look at most security products responses to trying to solve problems for company, it's very much this detect and remediate model of solutions. They're not really about being proactive, about updating technology in real time to try to block it. It's more or less, we need to have prior knowledge of a threat to be able to help you out. So once we know that it's there, we'll let you know that you've been attacked so that you can go and mop things up. And we really think to be effective in security, you're going to have to change that model. Better services that give you actionable intelligence, that update products in real time, to actually move from detection to prevention of actual threats. So if we move that into, you know, you know, the requirements for the future is that you're going to, going to need security in a lot more places than you, you did before. It's going to need to be at the mobile device. You know, more and more computing is in mobile devices. So having an actual presence at the client um, is, is going to be critical. Uh, that's really the edge of your network in a lot of cases. It's going to need to be at the Internet edge where we've already usually invested a lot of security infrastructure in. Um, we're also going to need to focus more on segmentation. So segmentation between employees and the actual services that they're getting access to. Concepts like least privilege access to resources are going to be critical. So you're going to have to understand who your employees are, where they're at, what roles they need, and what access they need into the actual services that you're providing to them. Because you cannot trust your employees. They could be, the, they're more than likely the thing that gets compromised that gets into your data center. Um, and then in the data center itself, both in the edge and between lateral movement of, of traffic inside of your data center. That's another big threat. You see a lot of lack of visibility horizontally between different service layers inside of the data center. And trends that we've been using in data centers to make them more effective and better used to us as a business have driven that lack of visibility. More virtualization, more movement of resources, more movement of workloads to different locations in the data center have made it very difficult to actually see what's going on in the data center. So getting technologies that give you better visibility into east-west traffic in your data center, not just the north-south traffic, and also have you know, public cloud and private clouds in mind. And so, um, if, so really, it, the answer to this is, is make the firewall do its job. If you really think about it, a firewall is really the only critical piece of infrastructure that's at all of these locations. You more than likely have firewalls at your branch offices, at your internet edge. A lot of organizations have firewalls <coughs> focused on the data center. Um, and so really the challenge is that the firewall has not been a very effective security tool. So we really need to make it do its job, is to, to go back to being that centerpiece of enterprise network security that it was whenever it was first invented. And so what we need the firewall to do to be effective with that is one, to see all the traffic that's in your network. Um, where regardless of port or protocol, really have an application-centric view of the traffic that's going through your network. Identify applications, map them to users, understand the roles of the business so that you can build effective security policy. The second is to control those uh, users regardless of their IP address, actually being able to identify users um, protect, protect against everything you know, um, and also be able to understand unknowns. So you're going to have to be able to, to build, have technology that understands current vulnerabilities, things that we have prior knowledge of, things that are common, you know, like uh, Sasser and, and uh, um, you know, ZeroGen and those types of vulnerabilities in, in malware that's on the network. So having signatures that allow you to be able to understand everything that's known, but then give you tools to identify and then create a feedback loop that makes the unknown known. I think that's critical. Um, give you fine-grained visibility into the traffic that's going through your network. So not just being able to identify you know, port 80, but being able to understand the applications that are in port 80 and give you granular control over what functionality you allow. You know, being able to do things like controlling what files get moved to Dropbox or what type of web applications uh, clients are or your end users are allowed to use for webmail. Um, controlling upload versus download. And then the last piece is really doing this without killing your network. You know, we don't want to incre increase controls and security, increase visibility while reducing performance of the network infrastructure. You've got to have products that go in and do, you know, full multi-gig capabilities. 
So if we look at this kind of in, you know, in context of an actual breach, so what this equates to is we call this the kill chain in security. Um, we're going to talk about how you know having a product like a single product that can do multiple security services can be beneficial at one of these more complex attacks. So if you look at what an attacker has to do, they have to get they have to breach your perimeter. Um, that's first and foremost. And so with a good next gen firewall, you can do a lot of security services in a single product. So you can do your basic segmentation, your firewall policy. So you can do that here at the first. So get better visibility into the traffic, enable the business critical applications, identify the risky ones, reduce your threat surface. And then you've got IPS services that are built in, so you should be able to block anything that's a known vulnerability or a virus, spyware, that type of activity. Um, URL filtering is another functionality that's built into, that should be built into a good next generation firewall, and that can prevent things like spear phishing campaigns or social media and that type of interaction as a threat into the network. And then lastly, having sandbox technology that allows you to analyze files that are going in and out of the network and actually look at their behavior in a virtual environment, and if it's malicious, be able to, to detect that generate a signature, deploy it to all of the devices in real time, and adapt to the emerging threats that are in the network. The second is delivery of malware. Um, this is really, you know, having something that's on the endpoint is going to be critical to this. So having a solution that's not only in your network but also in the endpoint and all connected to a sandbox is going to be critical. So sandboxing technology is, is a recent innovation in the marketplace that allows you to be able to look at those emerging threats, things like tar targeted attacks and zero-day malware inside of your infrastructure. Um, last thing is, is, last couple or more about uh, kind of uh, IT policy and what it is that we need to do to redesign things. So lateral movement is really about better defining segmentation really products to segment your network and looking at lateral movement. I mean, if you look at any of the major attacks that we've seen, uh, look at the target attack, for example, they actually came in through a contractor network that manages the, their HVAC environment. The HVAC environment is what got compromised. It had no controls between HVAC and their point of sale system. They were able to go from the HVAC environment laterally to the point of sale system compromise the point of sale system, move inside of the network to exfiltrate data without any visibility so that the nobody knew that they were gathering all the information that they were, and then when they were ready to actually exfiltrate, they got that data out. So there was a heavy element of using third-party access into the network, lateral movement within the network, avoiding detection through that, and then exfiltration. And the last piece there is exfiltrating data, and you can do that with IPS signatures and URL filtering. So really, I mean, you can see, like, these are complicated attacks. Um, you're going to need to have really a consolidation of security services so that you can have better operational efficiency in managing them and better visibility into the traffic. And that's it for that piece there. Um, so what we're going to do is kind of transition here, uh, and I'm going to do the Q&A with the guys here, and then we'll open it up. Um, real quick before we get started, you guys want to introduce yourselves? I'm Mike Ruff. I'm the Network Infrastructure Manager for DHCS. And I'm Gary Diaz. I'm the Security Operations Manager at DHCS. Can everybody hear us? Oh, well. Are our mics turned on? We're good? Okay. All right. So, Mike, um, I thought we'd kick it off is really kind of describe your initial use of the next generation firewall. And, I, you know, um, I, I, in talking about it before, you know, we, um, you know, the initial use was very basic. And so I, I just wanted to, you know, have your thoughts on how you guys started using the product and, and really how that's evolved over time. Yeah, we initially got the Palo Alto in just to kind of evaluate the security piece of it because we already had an existing firewall and in Palo Alto we do both, right? So when we got it, we, it was very easy to implement for us because we were able to just put it kind of on the inside of our ASAs in a tap mode and just kind of send all the spam traffic to the, the, the Palo Altos and have it collect. And we were able to get that up and running, you know, the first day and immediately start seeing traffic, threats, and malware that we weren't really able to see as easily before too so and then you know kind of another thing is um you know 
these guys have the network operations team is really responsible for keeping the lights on so they manage the box but there's two organizations that get value out of it so you've got this you know as you start to consolidate services you end up with these boxes that are kind of fence boxes right um, they add value to two different parts of the organization so Mike's team operates really you know the segmentation layer and the firewall itself but then security operations works with you guys in the product so what's it like having you know one platform that services the needs of more than one part of the organization yeah I mean before ISO kind of did their thing with, 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 with their security devices and we did our network stuff we work together but now that we have this single platform we kind of have to coordinate a lot more you know when ISO wants security changes or wants some more visibility of things or you know our policy changes we work with them to implement that on the Palo Alto and and the thing that we were getting all that with the Palo Alto that we weren't getting with our previous as uh, Chris has described is we could see the track before source destination port but we didn't have the visibility to see quickly tell is it what's going over that port what's the exact application Palo Alto easily allows us to see that plus you know the thing we also didn't get was the the integration into active directory so we know that user is that IP address you know so it's very easy for us to quickly tell and look up and, and, and figure out what's going on with the network or just kind of see traffic better so I have I have four experiences I could share um, on the very first day of, of using it we uh, caught a contractor that was syncing um, the internal uh, desktop hard drive with an external cloud uh, system so we found out he was exfiltrating information uh, that contractor was removed. Um, another one was we caught a consultant that had established an illegal backdoor to uh, remote into a system and log into the, uh, the contractor's um, personnel app to show that he had reported to work. And so the contractor that was on contract with a, a department that we service um, they were trying to figure out how he was reporting the hours that he was there but a lot of people didn't see him there as often as he said he was um, so we were able to easily um, we saw this information we saw someone was creating this remote connection um, we knew exactly which system was doing it and where it was connecting to externally we gave all that information <coughs> to the contractor and they fired that, that employee they were they, they knew something was going on but they never had the evidence for it um, again as Mike said a lot of adware and spyware infections are caught uh, that were on the systems that we weren't aware of before we knew exactly what system they were on users weren't even aware of it um, another thing that we did with it we had actually analyzed or over 120 different types of applications uh, that can set up a remote connection from a desktop, an encrypted remote connection to an external device. And most of those applications cannot be installed unless you have um, some type of elevated privilege, local admin. But out of the 120 that we had analyzed, we found that there were um, at least seven applications that could be run uh, without installing. Uh, Team Viewer as an example you may be aware of that one but that's one that someone can can actually activate and s connect to all your shared drives connect to an external system and be basically have an encrypted way to exfiltrate everything and unless you're analyzing all that encrypted data um, you could lose a lot of you could have a breach so we found uh, people that were doing that we we in contacted Palo Alto Palo Alto out of the 120 probably blocked 98 percent of those but there were a few that they weren't black <coughs> blocked we had that added to the list for everybody that has Palo Alto and um, now and we keep monitoring that list um, we had another situation that happened back in January where ransomware uh, hit a lot of state departments uh, it came in via an email uh, we have about approximately 9,000 users that we service and out of the 9,000 users 93 people clicked on the yeah. on this email uh, that email then attempted was was actually identified running over the wire by Palo Alto uh, by pan and it blocked uh, it being able to go back out 
to seven different countries and 50 different uh, command and control servers. Now, if it would have made it out, um, and there has been news of this uh, since the, the months since then in other states, uh, police departments, large school system was shut down the other day. Uh, that ransomware basically encrypted hard drive. It would encrypt your hard drive it was, if it was your own personal PC. Unfortunately for a, an enterprise system, it also encrypts everything that you're connected to. So all of your shared drives. So all it would take is one PC to get to one of those command and control servers, download the payload, encrypt all the shared drives, and basically DHCS and CDPH would have been shut down. They wouldn't have been had access to any data. So without having to either pay the ransom, which could be hundreds of thousands of dollars, or by reinstalling the servers, using backups, you know, and you would basically lose a day, two, three, however many days of work it would take to put things back to the way they were. So it paid for itself just in that event. Um, very, very valuable. Question. Yes. May I? Oh, yeah. So you could do all of that because of our auto networks. Before Palo Alto networks, are you saying that you couldn't catch any of those? Before Palo Alto networks, we were using other uh, systems like WebSense. Uh, but it was not catching this type of activity. It, it helped us. It's more detailed uh, than WebSense. Um, it, it gives us, um, it just gives us more data. It lets us see more about what's running across the wire. Um, and we have integrated PAN with our, we have a new security information and event management system. So we take the logs from, from PAN to feed into that so that we have two sources to something that correlates data with a variety of logs and then we also have someone who monitors, who also monitors PAN. But the, the thing about PAN is it also, uh, it's, it's active. I mean, it's, it provided the active blocks. We didn't have to sit there and just analyze the data. There, okay, so there's another thing I'd like to talk about. Um, and it's the approach that we take in the information security yeah. office and that's how we analyze products we don't just um, take it for granted that what the salespeople say their product is going to do that it will do because they'll all say that it can take you to the moon so we do comparative reports we do proofs of concept um, we make sure that we compare the architectures apples to apples um, and some of our, and not just talking about this product, but other products, um, we have looked at, um, for, uh, for example, our security information and event management without saying who the products were. Um, we analyzed one, we laid out what the architecture would be, we got some pr initial pricing for our budget, and for the organization as large as we were, and for the, where we were deploy wanted to deploy it, and for the redundancy that we want and the logging that we wanted. Um, the pricing was in the, between 500 and a million dollars, somewhere in that area. So another company came in and said, we can do it for half that price. Uh, we said, great, and what would you give us? They showed us what they would give us. I said, okay, great, do this. Here's our architecture map. We want you to place we, we want it to do this, here, 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 and here. Now give us, tell us what we would place there to do the same thing that product one would do, apples to apples, and then we did a side-by-side -side comparison. Once they came in with pricing, it was at $1.2 million. And once we had done a proof of concept, we found out that they failed on two or three of the five mandatory requirements that we had during our proof of concept. So it goes to show you that you might think you're saving up, saving money up front, the way salespeople come in and they try to get you started and once you've invested 350, 400,000, you're eventually gonna have to grow to that 1.2 million and you could have maybe done it for 700,000 and had much more capability than, than the other way around. So it's better to do that comparative analysis up front. It's better to do a, proof of a small proof of concept to actually see how it works and not just go by the sales hype. 
That's the best advice I can give. That's what we do at DHCS and the Information Security Office. And I think their use of it too um, kind of represents uh, <coughs> the value you can get out of a product that you can consolidate services into because you may not necessarily need to do that all at once. So, and I think that DHCS specifically was a good example of that, that the, where it hurt and where we could offer value in the beginning was that you needed a better intrusion detection system than what you had in place today. Right. So we put a platform in, we put it right behind the current firewalls, it added the value that we could bring in a way that was very, you know, non-disruptive to the network. And then as these other initiatives and needs have come down the road, more and more services have consolidated into the firewall. They're doing URL filtering in it. And moving, we're working on a project right now to do firewall migration. So it's going to be the complete firewall. So you've had budgets free up. And you know, in the meantime, you've got you know, fixed operational expenditures for the product. More and more services consolidate into it. So you know, you've got better security operations with less spin than you were doing before. And the flexibility to put it in more places that you could do before. Right. So I'd, I'd like to use that as a segue. Again, it's you don't necessarily need to, like we did with the SIM, you don't need to deploy the 700 and some thousand, 1.2 million all at once. But you should look at what could it end up being when you grow and you get it there. Is it going to cost you when you're totally done $700,000 or is it going to cost you $1.2 million? You need to look at those things. There are other competitive products. Um, I feel strongly about Palo Alto. That's why I'm here today, because we've looked at competitor products. And if we were to deploy them in the same, to give us the same type of services, it would take a lot more and a lot more money. So even though we didn't deploy throughout the whole enterprise right away, we knew what it was going to cost us when we got there compared to the other product that could cost two to three times as much. I think that's, that's really all we have in the structured stuff. Do you guys yeah. have any other questions? Kind of leverage the guys that are up here for today. I guess my question would be for Mike. Um, do you see it as product reducing the workload of your staff? I see it giving us better visibility and to quickly diagnose issues in like when we where we're in the network, we always get, we're the first ones to get blamed for something, of course. Mm -hmm. It's the network fault. So being able to go straight to the PAM to go, oh, look at the source, destination, the ports, and see what's really going on real quickly, and to go and, and figure out what the user is that's having that problem. It, for us, it helps speed up troubleshooting. And for me, I don't like to use a product that I find difficult, because we just don't end up using them. Like, right. We're throwing away different products. And Palanto has a very simple, easy to use GUI for me and, and our staff too, so that's, that's just our experience from the network side. I don't really deep di do the deep dive into the logs and security aspects like they do, but I mean, from the network side, that's the first tool we go to. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to that. I came from another department, which I won't mention, but they would always go, the other department always <coughs> went out and bought, um, took slices when they were looking at, you know, whether it was networking or security, and they would go after the absolute best of breed. And so they had 10 products, and they didn't, but then they didn't have the staffing to work with all of them. They didn't work with each other across, you know, all the platforms, so they, they didn't use half of them. What good is it to, to take a checkbox and say, okay, we implemented this, and it sits there, and no one, it never gets fine-tuned, and it doesn't do anything. It's better to have, it's better to have, like Mike is saying, something that you know you're going to get good value out of it. It's easy to use, you're going to use it, and you don't have... 10 different things to look at. So you guys do find that the material will more rapidly respond? Well, one of, one of the things that I've noticed, like, compared to, let's say, the AAC, and uh, is, like, when I want to filter stuff, the Palantir has a great filtering system. Oh, I want to look at this source, this destination. I don't want to look at DNS, because there's too many entries for that. I want to look at this, right? I can quickly filter through all the noise and go, okay, look, here's what we're looking at. Because a lot of times you get calls from from people who aren't technical. I ask them, what's their IP address? I don't need to know. I just type in their name, boom, I know where you're at. Then I can have my staff look at the see their switch board. Or now that we can know their IP, where they're at, I can track it down to the switch and see if, you know, if there's any issue. So to me, it's just uh, coming from a CLI world, the 
the GUI on the, the, the pan is very easy to use. I have tough questions because I'm seriously considering how long it works. I've been working with Kevin um, yeah. in domain. He's so, on my team. Um, having <coughs> said that, um, how do you comment on, or would you like to comment on uh, VMware attempt to go down from their virtual uh, machine level? Now they have the, the, the virtual network, and, and they basically mentioned that anybody else who's doing hardware, like Palo Alto Network or Cisco, they're just doing the plumbing and doing the intelligence to that. So would you like to comment uh, about their virtual networks? I think I think NSX, which is their yeah, software-defined networking platform, is one of the strongest technology partnerships I've ever worked with in my career. I don't see them as a competitor in that space at all. They have a very effective high throughput distributed firewall, but it is a dumb port-based firewall. Um, it doesn't do a lot of the policy orchestration that you get the benefit of with, it's like a truly disaggregated software-defined network. If you get to that point in your data center and you can move workflows and have a network reconfigure itself, security policy and that model doesn't necessarily orchestrate itself as well. So we've built a very strong relationship with, it, with VMware and NSX <coughs> to insert transparently at the hypervisor layer to give all of the same functionality you get from a physical firewall that's doing your north and south traffic into the hypervisor layer for all your east and west traffic. And it's all managed from one. So I, I'm very, I have very strong relationships with the people on those teams. It's very high level. It's at, uh, you know, at we our um, manager of all of our lab operations, Lee Clarich, is working with his counterpart in VMware to, to do joint development. So when they launched that, we were the first firewall to be plugged into it. Um, and so I think that's a strength. Uh, I think every, currently every customer that has purchased NSX in the state of California has purchased Palo Alto Networks as a part of it. We're batting a thousand on that. Um, you know, we've got deployments at uh, a, a couple of other state agencies that were, were very big strategic investments on their part in that particular product portfolio. So I think that's gonna be a strength, really, to be honest with you. Um, they have a firewall, but it's a basic firewall. I think that's it, huh? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you guys for, for showing up and participating. We appreciate it.